Okay, good afternoon. It's uh, 1500 on a, well, I don't know where in the country you are, but where I am, it's a, a reasonable afternoon. And uh, we've reached session 3BE, which I guess for some of you, maybe the last one you're attending. I still have one more to do after this. Um, as normal, please, any questions, put them in the group chat. You, uh, uh, you are muted, so uh, you won't be able to say anything out loud until the end, when I will, with all the power invested in me, allow you to unmute yourself. Um, this session, as I say, is 3BE. Chris is uh, doing this one. I'm not going to go and read the title. It's um, embarrassing to read the title because I always get it wrong. <laughs> and um, please remember the feedback at the end. Let, uh, um, let us know uh, how this session is so that we can uh, include similar things in, in next year's uh, conference. And um, Please in, enjoy. Uh, over to you, Chris. Okay, thanks, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm in a very wet and rainy Raleigh, North Carolina. So um, it's still in the morning over here, but uh, thanks for taking the time to, to spend the next hour uh, with me. Um, this session is really going to be about um, tailored fit, but it's really focused not so much on talking about tailored fit as a um, you know, why you should move to tailored fit. I'm not interested so much in that. I'm more interested in you uh, helping you as a technical person understand the impacts of if you are considering tailored or you're moving to tailored fit, what, what are the things that are going to change the behaviors and thoughts and some of the, the thinking around how you're going to manage your system because the way that you're paying for your software it impacts how you um, tailor the environment and, and think about how uh, to optimize uh, certain workloads, to, to, to keep price in check and keep uh, SLAs met as well. So think of this more as a uh, way of thinking about how to do, make sure you can manage your workloads, um, as we say here, in a world without capping, because as we'll go into this, we, we realize that, you know, capping that you may have been doing today is not so much a uh, strategic uh, tactic that you can use. So um, I'm sure you've seen this all through the last couple of weeks. Uh, one final reminder about uh, potentially if, if you have, uh, if you're able to do so, uh, help contribute to the NHS Charities uh, Trust that, that's supporting the NHS. It's been a, a very worthwhile um, uh, charity to contribute with. And uh, if you haven't done so yet, that's one last reminder to do, to do so for this conference. So let's, I want to start very quickly with a, with a, a sort of, overview of tailored fit. I, I assume most of you will understand a lot of it, but I just want to level set why we came to this this part. Um, so let me take a few minutes just to really understand why um, Z software pricing has evolved in the way that it is. So way back when, in the original ways, it was um, in the, probably the first 30 years of, of the mainframe. You sold IBM software at full capacity of the machine. You bought the machine, and that really was the reference point for, for charging for the software. By the late 1990s and into the early parts of this new millennium, um, there was a way of changing the, the, the pricing. So we weren't really charging according to the full capacity now, but we we're looking at something called subcapacity, and we used metric called the rolling four hour average. And so it was. I'll make a new charge on looking at what's your peak period across the month, and that would that would set the price for a lot of your software going forward. But it had some assumptions built into it. Um, it was modeled on the fact that you'd be using the vast majority of the, the machine as a high utilization rate. Um, and that would, you'd be planning your workloads around that as well. So you knew when your batch workloads were running, um, that gave you some white space for other workloads that could run at other times. That was very predictable. So you were able to do a lot of the planning around um, for capacity and both for performance around those um, ideas. But what really has happened in the last 20 years, obviously so many things have changed. Um, the way we run software, the way the businesses are operating today, it's much harder to say, um, when your predictable white space period is and where you can really hit high utilization levels. Um, 
the focus really has moved away quite a bit from batch to delivering, uh, processing in real time, instant responses um, to support the needs of the business. So um, the mainframe is not in isolation. It is uh, very much part of what IBM would term a hybrid cloud environment um, uh, where you have workloads being driven by mobiles, um, other technology that's really hitting the, the key systems of records, the DB2 databases, the Kix transactions that, are, that have been running on the system. And that's resulted in a, a more spikier workload, um, a less predictable workload. So you see peaks at different times. And as a result, and also tied into the fact that people have much larger machines these days, you will see actual overall utilization rates far lower on average than the, than the, the high 80, 90% that was the assumption under the rolling four hour average. And so that has changed the way that IBM has looked at the pricing. And so we've started to look at a more consumption based model, a removal of the, the sort of peak based things. And it allows you to then plan your mainframe workloads around the best outcome for the business and not just controlling um, the billing and architecting to that. So here's a real sort of example of, of how things change. You know, on the left here, very predictable. Um, everything is run, 1,000 units of work is running at the same level across 24 hours of a day. Um, but as we see more of our customers moving, shifting to the, to the right-hand side here, where um, the workload is much spikier, and you can understand that you know, if you were looking at this in terms of a uh, rolling for average peak basis, your high peaks in the middle of the day there would be contributing to a very high bill, even though at other times of the day in the early morning or late at night, uh, there is a much lower utilization rate. What actually a, a, a consumption-based pricing model means is that all three of these models actually ends up with the same um, uh, billing because it is you're being billed on the amount of work you're doing, not when you are actually doing it. And so I'm not going to, as I say, not compare and contrast the different types of uh, models here to see which is the best fit for you. It's something for you to consider and evaluate. There are options for, for the test workloads within the production. There's lots of options to look at. There is an enterprise capacity option, which gives you the, you know, removes the four, four average, but it's really a sort of all you could eat option. Really, I'm going to focus a little bit on the enterprise consumption one, which is really where we, we look at, um, it's more in line with a, with a pay-as-you-go model, uh, something more typical you'd see on the cloud side. So it's, it, you'd commit to a certain amount of, of MSUs, uh, which you consume whenever throughout the year. Um, you can hit peaks and spikes at any time of the day, week, month, whether that was pre predicted or not. Um, seasonal variations that may be applicable in your industry. So maybe you're in retail and it's, it's close to the end of the year. And so you see a much higher uh, utilization on your systems um, around Christmas time versus in the middle of the summer. Um, so you don't get variations in, in the billing there. It's actually allowing you to take advantage across that, across the whole year and critically take advantage of the, the facilities, the capabilities of your environment um, instead of limiting it to control the costs. And so very quickly about you know, how do we get to the, that pricing point? Um, this is a very simple one. We take a look at your uh, SCRT reports, what you've been doing in the previous uh, 12 months in terms of MLC and convert that into a, 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 um, a, co a consumption based model. And so this is a very simple one. You use 12 millions of ML, a million dollars of MLC last year. We're gonna work out uh, a number of MSUs that was consumed and that will give us a price point. And that was the initial sort of pricing of, the, of, of your MSUs across the year to, to hit your baseline. Now, IBM and I assume yourselves would want to grow the amount of workload because that should be a sign that you're growing your business as well. And growing, and growing the workload should be, I, I think for most people, it would be seen as a good thing because you're able to deliver more value and it's obviously you're being more successful in your business. So there is a competitive uh, growth price rate per MSU. So as you, if you, if you exceed what you consumed previously, you're not going to be uh, penalized 
if that was the right term for for growing it's actually competitive and, and attractive for you to grow your workloads across the year and so finally on this sort of initial step you know, where we're moving from before people would have this rolling four hour pricing across the entire enterprise which really impacted not just production workloads but uh, development and test across the environment because you you want to really focusing on making sure that your billing is predictable and um, uh, controlled so there's there's no surprises or, or peaks um, and the sort of after view here for the enterprise is that you have a production workload that that uh, is based on consumption and the work done and you can also then exploit something like a dev test container, which gives you full capacity use for, for non-production workloads to allow development and test to, to maximize use of the systems when uh, it, in that non-production environment. So that was really the, the basics. Um, what I'm gonna look at now is kind of turn it into who is interested in managing the workloads today, uh, particular emphasis on, on cost and performance. And hopefully this resonates with, with some of the, the challenges you may have been facing in the past and, and maybe thinking about in the future as you move to tailored fit. So I've, I've picked out three key user personas. Um, some of you may be in these roles, it may resonate with you. Um, they're based on a lot of the, the discussions we've had with clients over the past two, three years. Um, it's not exhaustive, so that there's also other people who are impacted by this, but um, these are three sort of general um, people who are looking at performance and cost uh, on the mainframe and uh, I've tried to make them sort of a general so that you can kind of uh, relate to some of them. So we've got Gemma who's in a management position. Um, she's obviously interested, less so in the technical side, but more in the cost. Um, she may have difficulty understanding how the mainframe costs out, what's the price per transaction, what's the price for her workloads, for her applications. And that can sometimes lead to perhaps a negative opinion of the mainframe. It's maybe less transparent to her to, to think of this. She's also thinking of um, making sure that, you know, she knows her business is dependent on quality of service as well. So she's, she's thinking about the bigger picture there. In the more technical roles, we've got an IT architect who's configuring the system. He handles the peaks. He's looking at um, the impact of the rolling four hour average, but, but not so much the overall application costs. And he's really re rewarded to handle the peaks that imp uh, by implementing those capping levels, present, preventing workloads, you know, running away at key times of the day and the month. He'll work directly with operations staff and system SMEs to, to react to, to issue. And then we sort of have a capacity planner who's thinking more long-term, working with Dan and to help influence Gemma and management. So he's impacted by the rolling four hour average because he's thinking about where the peak workloads are, potentially having to reduce service levels in some cases. He has a number of tools he uses um, and he looks at a lot of complex reporting tools and probably builds his own Excel spreadsheets so he's able to manage and plan for the environment or maybe he's inherited these from elsewhere. So let's assume that we're still under the rolling four hour average and, and, and what these users are, are really uh, focused on today, uh, what actions are they taking today? And this is typically what we hear, you know, the management level, cost control, they don't want surprises, they wanna be able to accurately manage their budgets. At a more technical level, they want to ensure the applications are running optimized, uh, but they do know that they, uh, they're they specifically focused on that peak period. Um, things that um, operate outside of the, out of that are really not the, the main focus there. And overall keeping cost control, making sure the capping and planning, um, so the operational costs are, are kept, in, kept in line. So that's sort of consequences to that. You know, at a planning level, you're using several tools to track the costs, make sure that the peak is, is, is being well managed, um, implementing various capping strategies to, to manage to, to keep the cost in, in line. Um, also, you might be seeing, you know, impacts to, to actual performance as a result of, of that capping uh, thing. You know, we have some, some important workloads that are running, they're not taking full advantages of the capabilities of the machine because we're managing to a cost. Um, and so that's, that, that can be often frustrating. 
and there's also a lack of a lack of flexibility. So you're trying to line up applications, peak periods, maybe shifting works to off peak periods, and that makes things difficult for the business to, 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 to deliver value. So as an example, you're looking at reports and really you're trying to make sure that you um, your peak period is managed, you're going, you know, there's no surprises when your SCRT reports are generated and you're making sure that the, the critical workloads that, that have to run within that peak period are being, are being um, managed and you understand the overall contribution to that rolling four hour average. But under this model, optimization really means introducing capping. And when you look at capping and within a, a rolling four hour average, it doesn't really come for free. It, it, you're looking at the costs, but you have to pay in terms of managing it. You have someone dedicated to make sure that this is really being you know, work tightly controlled, tightly optimized. Um, and as a result, you may be hitting along um, some problems. Um, particularly if you get a you know a, a spike of workload at a critical time of the of the day or the month that could introduce cpu delays because you're you're deprioritizing some workloads prioritizing others over the other that could increase response times there may be goals missed in terms of slas um, with that less work being displaced and so on so in some situations it could it could even get worse you know you're you're not um freeing up uh, resources quickly enough and in the worst cases, you know, you've got shortages in terms of um, uh, resources being being managed there. Um, capping is the technology, you know, that we're thinking about to, to manage to a rolling four hour average, but it's not really managing to optimize for the business. And so the, you end up with um, a team that's really focused on how can I optimize my rolling four hour average? And that's the most rewarding sort of question. You, you maybe be the hero for, for doing that, but it's not optimizing for the business. And that uh, can, be, can be an issue there. So if we move to a consumption-based installation, where does capping sit with this? Um, to some extent, when you're running with that four hour window, you, that's the thing that's impacting the cost. And outside of that window, you might sort of perceive that workload as free. That's the white space area. Um, the, the capping helped limit that, that peak so that you knew when it was and, and keeping that as, as tight as possible, but with all of the negative consequences on that on, uh, described on the previous slide. But in the consumption-based model, the, the capping is irrelevant because you're really being looking at the total MSU consumed. So if a batch workload takes a certain number of MSUs to complete, the fact that it takes longer um, uh, doesn't, doesn't save you on anything in terms of, uh, of consumption. Um, you want to be able to, to let that run and make sure that it makes the best use of the system, but you're not going to get any benefit by, by capping it and making it take any longer. It's still gonna take a certain amount of, of workload to do. And so you can't really control by capping on there. You need to think a little bit different about how you want to manage your workloads and, and, and optimizing there. So let's just go into a, a really practical example here. So here is a batch workload for which is requires a total of 10,000 MSUs to complete. And under a previous system, we have a, our machine is rated at, at, at 2,500 MSUs. But we cap it at, at, at 1800 to, to keep the cost in control. So it takes about five and a half hours to, to complete. And this is really a, an example that we've seen in real life as well with a customer in Germany. Um, as they move forward, they removed the capping so they could take full exploitation of the, the, the 2500 uh, rating of the machine. And in that case, the, the work, the batch workload completed, you know, an hour and a half sooner um which again frees up the the system to do other workload at that time um uh, we're not waiting until half past six in the morning to, to to bring other things on there may be other things that can be done there so batch windows in particular can be dramatically reduced by having these unnecessary soft caps in in the system and if there was a problem that you needed to recover from again you're making better use of the machine machine to do that um, 
without being overly uh, concerned about the, the cost uh, being capped or at, at a certain period of time. So going from, from rolling four hour average, let's let's move into to tailored fit pricing and, ha and how that would uh, uh, affect you. So um, while we're not thinking about capping so much now, there's there's probably new challenges that you need to, to think about. Um, Gemma and the line of business owners still occupied by the cost and needs to manage that to ensure they're getting value from, from the mainframe uh, as part of that overall hybrid cloud architecture. Um, they want to make sure that there's no uh, surprise cost at all. And again, at the technical side, we're thinking about um, the, the, the correlation between applications and, and the cost. So yes, one of the concerns that we often hear from clients is if we take off the, the handbrake of, of workload capping, then we might have some runaway applications that drive MSU consumption at a level they weren't expecting, or there's a surprise and we don't catch it quickly enough um, so that we um, again end up with a, with a surprise bill that, that's higher than expected. But that's really where the, the management of this comes in and being able to make sure that you can uh, plan what your, your consumption is across the year and make sure you can track that, and which, which I'll go into uh, uh, later on in this, in this presentation, to make sure that you can um, make effective use of that and also then think about how you would potentially optimize existing workloads that will benefit the applications um, and allow you to grow and deploy new workloads as well. So when moving to a model where um, consumption is really the primary means of measuring and quantifying workloads, what are the key things we need to think about that's different? And I've put these into sort of three phases that you, you maybe think about as you, as you go through this, this journey. Um, firstly, I mean, not everything changes. There's still a capacity on the machine that you need to think about but it isn't an artificial soft capacity. So you still need to focus on the things you do today, uh, storage, throughput, SLAs, whatever things that are, that are running. So the first step is, is really thinking about planning and you might have a good view on this, but if not, understanding where your key workloads are running and the resources they need will help you when uh, the enterprise containers are defined, what capacity of resources you are making available to each, and proper planning here means that you can architect the workloads that will benefit both the, the, the applications and the business. So you want to have flexibility to run online workloads and batch workloads according to the, to the business requirements um, without the, the capping restrictions. Secondly, is the real critical part which is, is the visibility to understand what your current MSU consumption is and how it's changing, um, as I say. We, we, we know there is a concern in the back of people's minds that, that removing soft caps will run, result in those runaway workloads and you get a surprise bill, but it doesn't need to be that way. If you have the visibility to, to daily, weekly, monthly consumption, it becomes very easy to detect changes. Um, even if the delta is small, uh, there's a, a little variance in the workloads, you are able to see that, that change, uh, understand if there is a workload that's causing some, some issues, um, or you brought a new workload online that's causing um, an increase in the, in the MSU consumptions, that, that having that visibility will help you there. And together with the ability to forecast that future consumption based on your past usage, though, that also takes away a lot of the surprise elements. So it's really critical that you have that visibility into to what, what resources are being consumed there. And finally, when you have a good view of, of, of on the management, you can start to make smart decisions around workload optimization. So you're probably at the moment, if you're on the, on, on the older models, trying to squeeze the last bit of efficiency out of a single four hour period every month. Um, and that's you know, very highly tuned, but you haven't probably focused on that, on that white space period and the, the remaining um, 700 odd hours of, of, of the week. Um, so there's some real scope to improve across the entire week with lots of um, areas to, to, to drive efficiency there and performance improvements. And if you're able to do that, then 
see that that's that's MSU save that they can, they can be pushed back into to the strategic workloads that you're trying to trying to manage and drive through the business. So throughout this presentation, when we're trying to address these and the scenarios, I'm going to leverage a, a, an IBM product called Z Performance and Capacity Analytics. Um, it's not specifically a tailor fit pricing tool. It has uh, analysis for for forecasting and and uh, performance analysis under rolling for our average, but we have developed some specific capabilities focused on TFP, and I'll I'll explore them going forward. Um, for those of you who don't know Z Performance and Capacity Analytics, we had a more detailed presentation on it earlier in the week, but there's three kind of key legs or capabilities to the product. We're looking at performance analysis, how are we performing today against uh, in the past, um, providing reports for management, take a deeper look, look at uh, resource consumption, um, check for exceptions in, in the performance that, that are going through there, and really driven from, from a lot of SMF, structured log data, uh, predefi predefined and summarized reports that, that can really help you consume, uh, easy to consume and help you un analyze your performance capabilities. Uh, then there's also capacity forecasting. So understand and make informed decisions around future application needs, make the right decisions um, uh, for, for future investment uh, in terms of both hardware resources, being able to support new workloads that the businesses are doing. Um, Typically, we find a lot of, of that, that work has been done by very highly skilled individuals within organizations, and they're often using homegrown or complex tooling that may not be as flexible when you're starting to look at how applications are driven from you know, mobile-driven workloads, uh, workloads coming off the platform, um, being able to respond to those questions around, well, can we support this? How does, what's the impact on our existing workloads to do this? And then the third part is really around cost. And obviously that's where tailored fit comes in, in in a big way, but also a lot of organizations provide, their mainframe teams are providing chargeback to internal customers or other lines of business within there in terms of the workloads being um, consumed. And you probably may have a complex way of looking at things in terms of uh, resources uh, under a rolling four hour average, but um, being able to take the data in terms of transactions or CPU being consumed and create a, a billing or, or, or some kind of showback capability as well for uh, workloads. So let's take a look at how this, the challenges that, that our, our personas are, are being faced with, with moving to tailored fit and how we can apply this to, to address our needs. So you know, measuring, forecasting MSU consumption um, uh, is, is gonna be critical for the, for the business leaders to look at this. Um, they're gonna be, I believe, be much happier looking at the transparency that they have in terms of saying, okay, this workload is consuming a certain amount of resources um, and how that feeds back into operational costs. Um, but they're also thinking about how, you know, where to invest, what resources for the new workloads. Um, they need to be able to see the projected consumption that, that can help them know where they're going to be at the end of the year. Um, if there is a, a, a true view of the, the cost of the workload and the impact, that helps the, the decisions to be made around business drivers. And they also do want to be uh, kept abreast of, of changes that, 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 they're, that may be happening. So quick feedback when usage has changed dramatically. Um, not everything is, is significant. We wanna know when things are, are really moving from what's been expected to, to what is actually being, being seen there. So maybe, maybe a new mobile banking application has been deployed on, on the cloud system that's now driving new workloads uh, on the mainframe. And maybe the mainframe team hasn't been informed of this this change that you know some some update on the, on the app is is now driving new transactional workloads in there. Um, can we make sure that we, we we capture that with our monitoring tools and also with our performance analysis tools that we're still meeting our SLAs, we're still responding to that, but also what's the impact in terms of the the workload that's being driven on the mainframe? 
so here is a, a summary workspace that we're, we're showing you that hopefully gives you a good level of transparency into how you're going across across the year here. So this example uh, workspace is showing you the enterprise containers that have been defined on your system and how much of the of the baseline MSU has been consumed to date. So as we were saying at the start, you sign a contract for TFP, you get an allocation of of, of MSUs as as the baseline for um, for your for your twelve month period, and you want to be able to track how far you're going through through the year. So we're roughly, I guess, in this case, two hundred fifty two days, so and about three quarters of the way through the year. Uh, one container is has used ninety two percent of its allocated entitlement. Um, the other is using has used up slightly less. Um, that's a good insight to have in terms of where your workloads are being um, used within that enterprise container. Um, and so it gives you a view of this of the um, uh, current usage um, at a fairly granular level but beyond what you might have seen from from an SCRT report. So we can drill down here into a, a weekly level report rather than just looking at the monthly consumption. So, if something has moved significantly in uh, the last week or the last couple of weeks because there's been a, a workload change, an application change, a problem on the system, we can start to see that you know we're consuming more than 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 than, than previously has been been shown there. So maybe there has been something that's, that's growing and, and we want to take a, a deeper look at this. And yep, remember here that the work is increasingly volatile. So there might be some spikes driven by um, an environmental, um, you know, something happening in the, in the world out there that, that, that's driving new workloads. Um, you know, we've had a very, very unpredictable year in terms of where workloads are going because, because of uh, COVID. So some some uh, companies have, have seen a drop off in terms of the amount of work that, that and, and transactions that are driving. Others have seen a big increase, um, and some have seen you know changes in terms of the patterns across the day when when the, the workloads are being being driven. So the the real focus here is is being able to say okay, has something changed, and can we see what how we're doing against uh, uh, what has been causing that to be the the, the change. And really, again, to, to really emphasize moving away from thinking about when consumption occurs to really how much is, con is, con is, is occurring and understanding the average that's being consumed across the time. So that would uh, deal with sort of variations that we might have seen there. And if we can see that, that delta of changes, then we can start to drill down and look at where the, where the problems or changes might have been. So going from our, our, our sort of high level view of, of the overall enterprise container, we can drill down and start to look at the, the MSU details of uh, across a maybe either monthly or a uh, weekly basis on a particular uh, container. And so we were able to, to get a, a broader view there. But then from that point, we can then start to drill down even further to understand what workload is running and where it's running. So going from uh, looking at the container, there's obviously a set number of LPARs within that container. We can start to look at the LPAR MSU usage. So the, in this particular bar chart, we've got actually there's three uh, LPARs in here. Now, one of them's using virtually nothing, but you can see there's a blue one and a purple one. You can see how the breakdown is across the workloads on those LPARs. So looking at potential differences there, and you can then start to drill down and look at service classes and, and actual workload MIPS here. So we're beginning to see on a particular period, um, what was the average consumption um, of certain workloads on certain LPARs. And you can then start to, as on the right hand side here, there's, there's filters that you can use to filter out the um, less relevant data that you, that you want to look at and drill down and actually look at, understand what are the key differences that are being able to, to, to do there. So you're now having a more transparent view uh, that can then really help the business. Um, we're also able to sort of augment the data or annotate business descriptors. So you can help to group certain applications or other associations. So you can do a little bit of a aggregation. So if you know certain transactions are part of a, 
a particular business line of business grouping. Um, that's done as part of the whole curation process. So it's really efficient way of getting hourly, daily, weekly, or monthly rollups of the data and, and looking at longer term trends as well. So rather than looking at single peak period, you want to look for for changes in, in the average consumption. The you know, peaks are still relevant in terms of the capacity of the machine. Um, but you really want to say, you know, are we consuming 3% more MSU than last week? Why is that? Is there a problem or a trend that was expected and, and um, uh, we can account for that? Or maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's not important and just a blip. But if it continues to trend in the different directions to what we expected, are we able to, to jump on that and maybe uh, identify the root cause? So in this example, we're tracking both uh, peak MIP usage and average across multiple days. This is really a, a dem demo system. So it's, it's kind of uh, um, slightly unusual data. So the light blue line is the peaks and the peaks are growing, which may be, may be that may have been a major issue in a capped rolling four hour average environment, but the uh, average usage seems, seems relatively flat. Um, probably hints here that the workload is, is, is more spiky than, than having a runaway or looping job there. But we might still want to go down further to understand why the, the peak uh, in a particular day is, is, is much higher. Um, why are we getting that peak period? But um, overall, the average is, is, is still relatively flat. And so doing that, that drill down there helps you uh, understand uh, the, the, the impact on that, on that system. And finally, really forecasting is, the, is, is, is a very critical part of this. So understanding how you're tracking against expectations. And an obvious one is we've got our MSU baseline for the year. How are we, how are we com com comparing against that? Um, here's a, a, a simpler uh, example here where we've got the, um, the, the, the entitlement baseline is the, is the horizontal dark blue line across the top. Um, and we've got a light blue line that's going from the bottom left towards the, the top right, which is actually our, our use to date. And we've used the, the capabilities of, of a uh, built-in forecasting algorithm to, to kind of track where we're, where we're heading towards. Um, and as you can see here, we are looking, we can kind of pinpoint the, 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 the dates where we think if we on this current trend, uh, where we will meet our entitlement baseline. And, that little sort of triangle area above the dark blue line is, is where we're moving into to growth MSUs. And that's that transition point from we've exhausted our, our baseline MSUs, we're now using growth MSUs. And that, that may be a good thing because you know, as the business looks at things, they go, okay, yeah, we, we're growing our workloads, our, our business is growing. Obviously it's gonna mean that we're, we're driving more MSUs across the system. Um, so that's a good thing. But also, we've got that forecast that says uh, how much into our growth MSUs are we going? And we know how much um, the cost of a growth MSU is. As, a, as I was saying earlier, it's, it's you know, competitively priced. You can start to make a cost estimate of what the additional um, cost point will be for that. Uh, uh, and the business understands the, the, the additional cost that will be incurred as a result of that, that growing business that, that's going in there. So that's great. Um, maybe you haven't been growing business though. You're looking at this and going, okay, well, we're, we're going to meet, we're going to exceed our, our, our baseline entitlement earlier than, than it, uh, and expected. So this is giving sort of real visibility into the fact that um, you might want to make some changes at this stage. You don't want to switch off systems in, in, in the end of December because uh, um, just to save some costs here. But if you're earlier in, enough in the year and you can see where the trend is going, and uh, the business can make decisions say, okay, well, we need to, to make some adjustments here to, to keep our costs in line. You have the visibility to do that and you have early enough to make that decision as well. And you can see if you are you know, optimizing workloads, taking some workloads offline, moving them elsewhere, that can then be, be tracked and you can see your forecast comes more in line with where you as the business want to be going forward. So this really all ties back to the, the overall cost of the business and giving that rather than thinking too much about managing to, to the cost of the technology. So you know, if, if, if you're in a particular industry where you know, there's maybe a retail and there is a, 
uh, the business wants to support a new sales events, you know, drive a, a new, try and trigger some more sales. It can sometimes be difficult under uh, certain pricing models to est estimate the impact on the workloads. If that's going to drive a lot more stuff that drives up the peak, then that's, that, that affects the, the cost of the mainframe all, all the way across. If you're looking, if you have a better estimate on terms of the MSU consumption, you'll be able to get a view of a cost per transaction or a cost of the consumption and, ha and help that. Um, again, you know, that, that then can be incorporated back into a, in a more transparent chargeback process. And I'll come into that uh, shortly, um, just so you can actually feed the cost back in a more transparent fashion to the, to the other parts of the business or to other consumers. And then um, from a technology standpoint, you can figure that all into your, into your capacity planning dashboards to know whether the uh, capabilities and the resources on the system can be uh, supported and uh, you can you can support the business from a you know meeting SLA targets as well so really one thing that you know I've, I've, I've hinted out or talked about in the in the last sort of 20 30 minutes has really been around the cost management areas as, as an improvement for, for TFP and and we do speak with customers who are, who are pleased with with the the more uh, transparency that they have in terms of, of viewing the systems. Um, cost prediction is, is improved because it's simpler and it's easier to work out how the application can, can support business. And, and many of our you know, mainframe shops are really charging other departments based on, on the resource usage. And in the past, there was maybe, you know, either a, a disconnect between looking at um, when workloads were running, what resources are being consumed and what the, what the, other, the, the other department or the partner was being, being billed for. Um, when you have a more transparent consumption-based model, you have the line of business users can get a, a much better idea of the likely costs uh, further before and so that can really be um, a benefit to, to the overall uh, mainframe team because it's it's allowing you to um, uh, get that that clearer, more transparent view on chargeback or showback. So what you what typically would happen, and we can do this certainly with performance and capacity analytics, is is really you know you bringing in the same data that you're using to track the systems but also tying that into resource accounting to produce the billing and uh, records and reports so um, you can collect and summarize that data from all of the systems and uh, collect information about what who your customers are what you want to bill on which is now more transparent that could be something like uh, msu consumption it could be tra transactional based and how you want to charge for them as well, and then calculate that from the same data that you're using to track your overall consumption. Um, and that would really help us um, determine uh, the way for each, each billing period, you, your consumers can then be charged according to that actual level of system usage there. So we could use something basic like CPU seconds. We could use a functional unit like a kicks transaction. Um, you can define that and and, and implement that, uh, but but with tailored fit, you can probably be more transparent with your customers in terms of showing you that. So, here is a uh, an example of of um, a report showing application monthly costs, and you can tie that back to showing you which which workloads particularly are driving the the highest amount of cost there. That can be fed back to charging to, to those particular businesses or, or partners that are that are driving workload as well. So, so the last topic I really want to uh, touch on is 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 that that in that three stage journey is the third one is really optimizing to maximize the benefit to tailor fit pricing, um, and you know. The real emphasis here is that every MSU is of equal value. It's not that the in the past where the the workload that runs within the peak is 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 a very high value, and and things that run at at four o'clock on Saturday afternoon is of a very little value. All of them are of, of equal value. So, um, whereas in the past you're, you're tuning the system to to be best within that peak period. 
there is a lot of areas where you can actually look to optimize workloads to really benefit uh, telephone pricing. So you want to start by actually identifying which workloads are, are candidates for tuning. Um, maybe it's the ones consuming the most MSUs, maybe it's other things that are consuming some, but, but really if you did a sort of cost uh, value analysis, the, the cost of running those workloads is, is less than the value that you're getting out of it. Um, so by having a view of, of, of who maybe are, are your top consumers, you can then start to, to focus efficiencies around which are the best um, areas to, to derive real value across the system. So really just to emphasize this point here is that the kind of looking at a four hour peak here, you spent a lot of time making sure optimizing within that four hour peak. But really all of this other work outside of the peak is just as important to manage. So where do you really start with focusing um, uh, the right workloads to look at? So as I said, starting with the reports within performance and capacity analytics can help here. Um, as you haven't looked outside the peak window, there's probably a really good chance that there's some, some quick wins to have. Looking across the weeks at MSU consumptions per application and jobs will set you in the, in the, in the right direction there. So for example, you may have applications that perform important tasks or utilities that uh, across the week that maybe haven't been updated or recompiled for some time. Um, there's improvements in hardware technology, there's improvements in compiler technologies. So um, they can also help in, in reducing the overall consumption without actually having to refactor applications or even taking them offline. Um, you can use tools like uh, automatic binary optimizer without having to rewrite uh, COBOL applications, for example. There's other tools such as that take advantage of, of in-memory caching like uh, uh, table accelerator that could also improve efficiencies that mean that uh, an actual application without having to rewrite it can, can consume less uh, or fewer MSUs. There may be workloads that, that didn't run within the peak and you haven't really taken a close look at, at their values. So maybe you're looking at things that might be redundant uh, now that, that um, like I said, not, not deriving the value that, that you originally thought. So um, you might have see backups of data sets that you may be doing an excessive amount of backups just to be safe, or maybe you need to do some, some database uh, reorganization. When you mm -hmm. focus on the entire week, you can look across that for, uh, at all these tasks. And then there's other optimizations that you might want to look at. So uh, under a rolling four hour average, the, the um, zip eligible work that runs on a general processor outside the peak is really not likely to cause you much concern. Um, but if you're under a consumption model um, where every MSU is, 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 is of equal value, then a, a, a zip eligible work that is, is running on, on, on the general processor is consuming some of your MSU allocation. And so you wanna make sure you're making best use of that zip investment and as much zip eligible work is, is running there. So, you know, across all these steps, having the visibility to make that informed decision is critical. So I'll just deep dive slightly into some of these things. I've, I've touched on some of this, but in terms of application optimizations, you can look at the, start to make a constructive assessment of the value each, each application is, is taking. So, um, this should be a task that you know you can get your application architects involved in. I've already spoken a little bit about recompiling workloads uh, to take advantage of new compiler and hardware technologies. If those same workloads now consume fewer MSUs, then that that frees it up to be used to for more strategic workloads. Um, or if there's uh, redundant workloads that that are not contributing the value that were once expected, you know you can start to take that offline um, and and make changes there. And you can use the reports here to understand, you know, who, who's consuming what on the system. So uh, having a real good view to find firstly the top consumers, but then other workloads that all adds up to, 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 to give uh, the overall consumption uh, focused on that. That's something to really, to really think about. Then as you start to look at subsystems, although you wouldn't be driven so much by, by the MLC costs now, um, your key subsystems will, will still be, you know, your top consumers of, of MSU. So there's a couple of ways you can start to, to do this again. Um, 
One is, is reducing the overhead through efficiencies. So you know, looking to make sure you make best use of the zip-off loads. When you're, when, well, not so much when are you running your database maintenance tasks, but how often are you making them run at the best times of the day to make the best use of things? Um, are you making sure that you have tuning in terms of if things can be buffered? Um, cloning, and in this case, IMS databases, but certainly taking a, a look at all of the different utility tools that, you, that you're running to make sure they run at the best time of the day uh, so you don't make best mm -hmm. use of the systems. Um, again, look at task reduction or avoidance. So, you know, reorganize databases when it adds value, uh, recover from backup. Uh, what, understand, you know, when, when should we do a backup? When does the batch workload end? That we, that's when we should be doing database backups. And so you can reduce sort of things such as checkpoint processing without making full application changes. And I've already spoken a little bit about the zip eligible workloads, but here's an example report showing that, you know, you can, zips provide a, a, a really good way of, of offloading uh, MSU consumption. So uh, in the past, you know, is really in the peak is where you wanted to make best use of your zips. If you have a view of when your zip eligible workload is running um, and you can make sure that the, the, the best uh, use of that, then taking something like this report, understanding when you have zip eligible work and making sure that it does not run on the general processor, um, uh, you, can, you can certainly help optimize, optimize your cost there, but also optimize potentially the workloads as well. So with that, uh, we've come to the end. I think there's a few little sort of key things that I just want you to, to emphasize. I hope to, I'm, I've hit on these points several times throughout the, the, the 50 odd minutes I've been speaking, but when you move to tailored fit, every MSU counts. Um, it really does um, change a sort of paradigm shift in how you think about managing on the system. Um, it is no longer the case that you're really focused on a, on a peak four hour average. Um, instead, you really need to focus on the activities across all the hours and have visibility into that. Understand really what are you doing today, um, where the workloads are running, what's the best use of the capacities, and then think about what tasks are really adding value to the system and, and when are they running, um, how and validating that you know, what are the, what are the consumption levels of, of those applications? Then as you have that visibility and you're able to, to uh, look at how the workload is, is tied back to, to business drivers ultimately, because that's where really where we're, that's driving the investment in the platform is how can we make best use of that? Um, can we optimize or reduce MSUs for tasks that need to be done? by taking advantage of things such as zips and, and other storage devices use tools that consume fewer resources that uh, will make it uh, better use of your your msu baseline allocation such that you can then invest that that workload and that allocation into strategic business business value applications as well so if you want to learn any more, um, I've uploaded the slides. So there's some links here for some for more information. A lot of it covers what I've spoken about today, both from tailored fit, performance and capacity analytics. If you want to get your hands on with some of this, we have some labs also as well. Um, but that's all I have. Um, I'll open up for, for questions. Um, Anna, if we have any. Uh, none in the uh, chat, but I'm just going to give people the power to unmute themselves you have the power so uh, feel free to unmute yourself and see if you have any questions for Grace oh from Harrick to everyone we have spent a lot of time and effort removing DFHSM from our ro rolling for our average I just love these uh, abbreviations um, DFHSM is our second largest workload across a month's usage. So TFP will effectively, or tailor fit pricing, sorry, will yeah. effectively undo all that work. What is IBM doing about making its own products more efficient or zip eligible? 
Well, I can't speak for that particular workload in particular, uh, especially, I mean, for a start, you don't have to go to TFP. Um, it is a decision that, you know, you do the do the calculations to make sure that it, that it is the right uh, model for, for the workloads that, that you want to run. Um, certainly, I know of, of, of a lot of applications that, certainly over the last decade, we've been putting a, a lot more workloads onto ZIPs. I think that with TFP, the value of ZIPs goes up quite a lot because it's now the ZIP utilization can be can be realized across the, the whole uh, seven days of a week rather than just uh, within the peak period. Um, performance and capacity analytics that I spoke about today, that's got ZIP eligible collection and, 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 and uh, curation capabilities. So we really worked hard to SMF processing is, is, a, is a big, heavy um, task. And I know that people, you know, if you've got SAS uh, databases and, and, and running queries on that and, and processing huge amounts of SMF data, that can be a real heavyweight task. So it was often shoved into the middle of the night to do processing there. What we've done certainly with performance and capacity analytics is turn it into a, a near real-time collection and curation process, which keeps things sort of little and often collections rather than one big batch but also zip offloaded that so that it's not going to be a big burden on, on uh, processing all of that SMF records. And I know that there's a lot of other, you know, Java-based workloads and other things that are, that are being pushed onto, um, onto zips as well. I hope that uh, uh, was a satisfactory answer. <laughs> Um, for a slightly um, tricky question. Uh, anyone else with anything? Okay, so uh, just a reminder of the feedback then. This was the session 3BE. Um, feel free to um, put some very nice comments in there and uh, help us with next year's uh, uh, conference. Um, there is one more session uh, on, on my track um, uh, at uh, 4.30 uh, UK time. So maybe see some more of you back there then. And um, again, the charity, um, just uh, feel free to uh, buy those raffle tickets and drop the money straight into the uh, NHS charities together uh, with the uh, Virgin Money Giving, um, which will uh, obviously, you'll not win <laughs> because there are no uh, raffle tickets. They are also virtual this year. Uh, so please. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the, the two weeks of sessions. Uh, as I say, there's only uh, uh, one left on my track. I think that's the same with everybody else's. Uh, but it's been great fun having you all uh, share this experience with me. Um, okay. If, uh, if there's nothing else, nobody wants to jump in with anything, I will thank uh, Chris for, for this presentation and I thank all of you for attending and please um, stay safe. <laughs> Roll on next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's been very interesting to do it virtual first time and uh, um, there have been quite some advantages to that too, I think. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what we decide to do next year. Take care of yourselves. Thank you, Adam. You're welcome.